17 million migratory birds visit the UK each year. There is a huge motorway for birds in the sky and our coastal wetlands are the service station. Do you do any bird impressions, Milo? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you're filming this, aren't you? I'm Milo Sumner and I'm the East Coast Wetlands Programme Manager for the RSPB. When we talk about coastal wetlands, what we're really talking about is how mud and water and wildlife come together. So what's so great about mud? Mud is dynamic. It's often washed down rivers, this kind of soft sediment that's full of loads of nutrients, but it also provides excellent living space for invertebrates and larvae and small mollusks, which ultimately are a nutrient-rich food source for birds that live on those wetlands. It's easy to think at first glance that wetlands are empty of life, but actually it's, it's everywhere. Beneath your feet in the mud, it's packed with small invertebrates, worms and larvae that are a fantastic food source for the larger animals that live there. There are small secretive animals in the ditches and in the reed beds. You could have water voles, dragonflies, frogs, newts, small fish. Deer and other animals will graze on the salt marsh. And of course, you've got absolutely loads of birds. Flocks of geese flying overhead, small waders moving up as the tide chases them. Things like red shank, avocet, the RSPB logo bird, to the raptors, the marsh harriers, and the peregrine falcons. There's nothing quite like a wetland. Everywhere you look in a wetland, you're seeing natural processes at play and wildlife breeding, feeding, hiding, resting. Wetlands do lots of things. They've got real superpowers for people and for wildlife. Today we're at RSPB Titchwell Marsh. Titchwell sits in the middle of a landscape that we call the East Coast Wetlands in the RSPB. The East Coast Wetlands are a network of valuable wetland habitats that sit on the coast between the Humber Estuary in the north all the way down to the Thames Estuary in the south. Our coastal wetlands are really important for their international role. Each year, up to 17 million migratory birds visit the UK and they're traveling along something called the East Atlantic Flyway. And this is basically a huge motorway for birds in the sky. And our coastal wetlands are so valuable because they're basically the service station. These birds are flying thousands of miles and they need somewhere to pull over. Some birds will just pass through and quickly fill their bellies and have a rest. Others will arrive here to spend the winter or to breed in the summer. Of course, they're fantastic for wildlife, but actually wetlands do so much more for us, for people, for society. Coastal wetlands are really the front line of our fight against climate change. They store carbon. Salt marsh can store carbon 40 times as fast as a typical forest. They also are fantastic for helping with flooding from the sea and coastal erosion. As sea levels rise and the weather becomes more unpredictable and stormy, a nice coastal wetland allows all of that energy from the waves to dissipate slowly. And by the time it reaches dry land, it's less of a threat. They also are fantastic for storing water if they're in an estuary and there's a lot of rainfall or a potential flood event. And I think crucially for our well-being, they do so much for society and we're just starting to recognize that and put a value on it. Our coastal wetlands are under threat from several directions. With climate change as sea levels rise and the weather becomes more erratic and more extreme, these soft vulnerable edge habitats are either being squeezed out or completely eroded away. Historically, one of the biggest threats of coastal wetlands is that they're undervalued. We viewed these wetlands as wastelands. Even the Romans practiced regular draining of wetlands. And in the last 200 years, we really stepped that up. And most of our large coastal wetlands are now farmland, dry and drained, or supporting houses and other urban infrastructure. We really want as many people as possible from all parts of the country to come and visit our coastal wetlands, because the more people that come here that understand how fantastic and valuable they are, the safer these wetlands are and the more likely we are to be able to succeed to conserve them for future generations. The East Coast Wetlands Programme is the umbrella term for all of the work that we're doing on our own land but also with all of the partners out there to make sure that our coastal wetlands remain resilient. As we move into the future, we have an opportunity to think differently about how we adapt our coastline. In the UK, along most of our coastline, we've got hard sea defences, but coastal wetland creation really relies on softer coastlines. In areas where it's appropriate, where people and property aren't at risk and wildlife stands to benefit, one of the most powerful things we can do 
is to let the sea in, in a controlled way, to work its magic, to harness natural processes and let wetlands do what they do best, to protect wildlife and to protect us. Creating new wetlands is complicated. On the Essex coastline, we've got a site that we're really proud of called Wallasey Island, the biggest wetland that we've really created in the RSPB. That was made by identifying a coastal site that had been turned to farmland and thinking about how we might restore it to coastal wetland conditions. Wallasey was actually made by partnering with Crossrail when it was being developed. And all of that earth and soil taken out of the ground to build those tunnels was taken to Wallasey. Sometimes a coastal project, a big habitat creation project, can be 10 years in the making or more. And what's great about the RSPB is that we're in a position to take that long view Looking to the future, as our coastline changes with climate change, we're always looking to the horizon to see where is the next place where we want to create a new wetland site. So when I think about the future of the East Coast wetlands, I see a coastline that's thriving with ports and with coastal communities that are all working in harmony with the natural processes that help wildlife thrive alongside us. And so as part of our work to make sure that these wetlands are valued like they should be, we're really pleased that the landscape was recently added to the UNESCO World Heritage Site tentative list. And what that basically means is that we're at the next stage of working towards having this whole landscape recognised on an international stage. And if it was successful, it would join sites like the Great Barrier Reef and Mount Kilimanjaro, which is thrilling.